everybody. My name is Gavin Shepard, as was ably introduced by Johnny. I am wearing my name tag down by the side. I have a nice collection of these at home that I've been collecting for quite some time. And I have the privilege of going a little later in the day, um, and also kind of a bit of a penalty at the same time. I have the privilege because I've been able to be inspired by a lot of really incredible speakers that we've all seen, and a bit of a penalty because I have to follow these acts, and also because some of them have already talked a lot about the things that I wanted to speak. Um, and that's a good thing, though, because it opens my mind to different places and different places that we can go. I've actually, full disclosure, I've written three 18-minute um, speeches for today. <laughs> I will probably use none of them, maybe a piece here and there and whatever. I wrote the first one uh, around this idea of creative education, something that I've dedicated my life towards um, in the professional and a personal aspect. And I wrote it, and in the TED Talks, they have these TED Commandments, as I'm sure most of you are aware of, and it says, you know, you can't talk about your business or your company or your organization. And so I, I painstakingly wrote this speech for 18 minutes long without saying the word remix once. And I was really proud of it, but also really frustrated at the same time. And so I crumpled it up and I threw it out. And about uh, 12 midnight, day before yesterday, I started on my second one. And I wrote an entire new thing, and it was very personal. It talked about growing up, it talked about what my experiences were. And I realized that I was a raging egomaniac. <laughs> and so I threw that one out as well. And, uh, and tried to write something somewhere in between. And I guess that's what my, my talk will be today, is, is, is a mix of the personal and the professional, uh, a mix of anecdote and statistic, and basically just trying to talk about what this, this idea of creative education means to me, because it's a very open concept. Um, it can go in so many different ways. We can talk about the state of the current education system, we could talk about learning, and we could talk about educating creativity, although I think that might be a bit problematic because I actually don't believe that you can educate creativity. I believe we can obviously foster creativity. I believe that we can help grow, we can incubate creativity, but we don't educate creativity. We're born creative. Um, but much more able speakers have, have spoken about that type of thing, uh, as was witnessed earlier by Elizabeth Gilbert, and uh, one of my favorite TED Talks of all time is Sir Ken Robinson as well. He does an absolutely incredible job around this topic. Um, I'm not an academic, um, but I consider myself a lifelong learner, and I consider myself someone who is, who is in the pursuit of knowledge. Um, the reason, at least in my opinion, why I haven't become a, an academic, per se, or a professional academic, is, is twofold. Uh, one, that's just not what we did where I grew up. Uh, I came from a very blue-collar neighborhood, um, very working class, out of 14 friends of mine. Four of us actually graduated high school on time. Um, after several years of going back, of doing night school, of doing their GEDs and whatnot, that number rose up to nine out of the 14, uh, which is a pretty dismal, dismal number, but it's actually not out of the norm at all in the city of Toronto. I was not one of the original four that graduated on time, and I might have been one of the nine. I've actually never gone back to check after a couple victory laps in high school to see if I got that diploma or not. But um, as I said, I, I still feel like I've dedicated my life to this, and I've one of the reasons, the other reason is that I feel like I've also, to be blatantly honest, I feel like I've been insulted by the education system um, many times over the course of my life, the formal education system. I've had some incredible teachers. I've had some absolutely brilliant people, uh, specifically a man named Scott Johnstone who inspired me to, to be where I am today in my life and actually stopped me from dropping out of high school in grade 10. But I've also had a bunch of different experiences. How many people have been in this room, I just wanted to ask, have ever been tested to see um, you know, if they're, if they're brilliant or if they're willing to skip a grade or if there's to be advanced um, is one of the words, by a show of hands. And there's, uh, there's nothing to be ashamed of at all. Uh, it's <laughs> actually something you might be a little bit proud about. Um, but on the other side of that, how many have been tested to see what's wrong with them? A couple of us, yeah. Um, that was definitely my experience. I was 12 years old, grade seven, and um, after spending about a year in, in, in school, uh, with a substitute teacher, our, our teacher, I don't know what happened to him, he just kind of dipped and took off, but after about a year of having a substitute teacher who refused to call me by my name, called me Gauvin the entire time, it's one of the most frustrating experiences, um, finally I get pulled out of the classroom, I get brought down to the principal's office, I have no idea what I've done, and they're like, listen, we, you know what, we're going to do something different, we want to talk to you, um, and, and we want you to do a test. And I was at first wondering what this was all about, um, you know, I had no prior knowledge of what I was walking into, and so I get put into this room, and for the next two days, I do a series of tests, which I later found out was to find out what my disability was or what my problem was. Um, the results of this test came back, and I was diagnosed as 
apathetic. Um, <laughs> <laughs> what it was is I actually didn't give a f anything about uh, what was happening around me. And that's actually kind of a prognosis which has been kind of dumped on most of my generation, I think. Um, you know, that we're apathetic, that we don't care about politics, that we don't care about the world, um, that we're very focused on me. Um, my contention was I wasn't engaged. Um, it wasn't fun learning. It, it, I had absolutely zero fun. I, had, I wasn't having a good time, and so I tuned out. Um, the response of me trying to engage my fellow classmates, and, and Don Tapscott was speaking earlier around this idea of like students learning together, sharing answers, and, and trying to figure things out on their own in group dynamics. Um, this was something that I natively understand, um, and this was my understanding. My response was, this is, the, uh, this is the classroom, this is the teacher's desk. I was moved, a lot of kids understand this, they were moved to sit in front of the teacher when you're like facing the teacher. From there, I guess I wasn't far enough away from the rest of the students, so I was moved over to the side of the desk. And then from there, there's a television set. We used to get our announcements on television, which was pretty crazy. But we, we got our announcements there, so then I was moved to behind the television, facing the chalkboard, um, and that's where I was supposed to, to, to take part for the rest of the time. So I felt pretty insulted. Um, obviously at that point in my life by the education system, and ever since then I kind of just tuned out. Um, and I've never really tuned back in in that regards. And it's something that's actually a regret in my life because I have a lot of really, really incredibly brilliant friends who've gone on to post-secondary and have done amazing things and said, don't worry, it's nothing like what you know, you know. It's nothing like what middle school or high school was. It's a completely different environment. And um, this is something that, that has, has kind of like really bothered me over the last couple of years. So, I guess from these experiences, you know, and from seeing a bunch of my friends not succeeding, from not succeeding myself, but for understanding that I was really involved and I was really engaged, and I actually did like read voraciously. I was I, like, I had an incredible thirst for knowledge. Um, at the same time, I also had a thirst for a community, because there's several different types of intelligences in the world, right? There's um, kinesthetic, there's also the auditory, there's visual, there's all these different things. There's also something called interpersonal intelligence. It's something that where people relate to each other. It's also known as emotional intelligence in a lot of cases. Um, emotional intelligence was something I shared. I craved community, I craved talking to people. I learned by exchanging ideas, by having conversations and whatnot. And so I used to go to this one community center in my neighborhood and it was one of the few places where I was able to escape my little bubble at home where I was just reading Hardy Boys books and different things of that nature and actually get to meet other people from my block and from my neighborhood. And at first I would never want to go there. You know, this place was like, you know, it was your typical community center, had a couple computers, whatever. I thought it was corny. I didn't think it was cool. But one of my boys, he was from Queens, New York, um, he used to literally come and knock on my door and drag me out of my house and bring me down to the community center. Um, and, you know, I finally, over some time of going there, hanging out, getting to know different people, I really started to build, like, you know, a, an affinity for that place and build a lot of relationships that, that meant a lot to me. But what happened was this guy, you know, his mother came up to, to, to get him back. Like I say, he's from South Jamaica, Queens in New York, and he was one of those natural leaders. You know, everybody has those natural leaders in their group of friends, in their community, that for better or for worse, you follow that guy. You follow him to the party, you follow him into some dumb stuff, but you also follow him to, for other good reasons. Um, and so when he went back, the whole community center kind of just went and it fell apart, and nobody was showing up anymore. And I was just like, well, this sucks. Um, you know, what can, what can I do about this? You know, because I, I had grown attached to it. And I used to go to this thing called the 416 Graffiti Expo. 416 Graffiti Expo is this graffiti exposition that used to happen in downtown Toronto. It was put on by a company by REM, named REMG. It was absolutely amazing. It was like candy for the senses. You know, you had people doing live graffiti, full pieces and murals. You had people break dancing, people spinning on turntables, playing music, rapping, everything, like all in one place. And um, it would blow my mind. You know, it would absolutely blow my mind. And I would come back to my block and I would tell all my friends about it. And I'd just be like, you guys don't understand. It was, it was so amazing. You had all these things happening. All these people were there. And two things about this is, one is I was coming back and I was telling them and I was so charged and I was so excited. And I was like, we have to do this every day. The reason why I was coming back to tell all my friends about this and they weren't even sharing it with me is a lot of kids in our communities in Toronto, um, and I think this is true all around the world, are scared to leave their neighborhood, especially in places that are called priority neighborhoods, you know, or youth who are labeled at risk, or what we know as living in the hood or just being young. Um, they're scared to leave. The hood is their safety blanket. Their neighborhood is, is what they know. And for one reason or another, it doesn't matter if it's logical, it doesn't matter if it has reason or whatever attached to it, they won't leave because they think something could happen out there. 
because something happened to their friend, and then maybe something at high school happened, and now all of a sudden it's not safe, you know, because I don't know who's out there or who's watching who and what's happening. And there's this extreme sense of paranoia in a lot of our neighborhoods. Um, so I would come back and I would relay this thing, you know, and people would be like, yo, dude, whatever, man. And I'd be like, no, imagine if we had this every day. Like, imagine this energy if we had this every single day. And they're just like, all right, man, you know, keep dreaming. So I did dream. And I did something about it. And I wrote this essay. I had no idea. I was 17 years old. I had no idea how to write a grant or how to structure a proposal or do something like that. But I wrote an essay, Why We Should Have a Hip Hop Community Center. And um, the reason I chose hip hop is hip hop is one of the most you know, dominant popular cultural forms in the world today. Um, I've had the blessing to travel in a lot of different places, in, from Brazil to South Africa uh, to China and back. And in all of these places, hip hop is a dominant youth form. And for me, growing up in South Etobicoke, Lakeshore Boulevard, that is one of the most diverse areas in a city praised for multiculturalism. I mean, we have uh, a mosque, a Hindi temple, a Jehovah's Witness hall, a Presby Korean Presbyterian church, and a Catholic church, all within a four block square radius. You can imagine what that is. At the bottom of my street, millionaires, gated houses. Top of my street, housing. So all of these walks of life are all in this place. And the one thing that we all subscribe to is hip hop culture. And so I wrote this essay and I brought it into the, to the community center and I said, okay, you know, put it on the table. I was like, look, this is how we're gonna get people here. This is gonna save the community center. This is how it's gonna work. And um, the gentleman who I brought it to, was a cool guy, open-minded guy, but completely different generation, right? And he, uh, he looked at it and he was like, hip hop. So hoes. Um, guns, bling, like I don't, I don't see how this ascribes to any, or subscribes to anything that we believe in here. And I was like, no, you don't understand. It's a culture. It's the way that we view the world. It's a lens. Like those things are things that are talked about by some people in the culture, but there's other things too. It's a medium. It's a form of expression. It's the oldest form of music in the world. It's the spoken word and it's the drum. It's dance. It's painting on walls. You don't get more older or ancient than these things. It's just reinterpreted in today's in today's form, right? And coming out in youth culture. And so he said, okay, I'll give it a chance. But first, and he gave me one of my first lessons that was most important. He's like, prove it to me. Prove that the community wants this, that this isn't just your idea. And this is something that would go on to inform our work um, over the next few years, was that if it's gonna be for the community, it should be of the community, right? And a lot of times we have these ivory towers and we think about what's right for people and what could make sense and only if people went this way, this could work, you know? But people don't just go this way so it can work. People are people, people are humans. We have our own reasons for doing things and they go off in different directions. And so with the best intentions in the world, we get placed in urban hells. Um, look at Regent Park, you know? Regent Park, there's some beautiful things going on in there. There's love every day of your life in there, but there's also drugs, there's violence, there's crime, you know? It's not safe to walk there at night for men and women. That was supposed to be one of the greatest hopes for Toronto. Um, in terms of in housing. We spoke earlier of urban planning and it made me think of these things, you know, of what these old buildings were supposed to be. They're supposed to be places for communities, for love, for families to grow, for people to flourish. Um, and what they've turned into are priority neighborhoods. Um, so we need to ask people. And so we did. And we went out, we started doing surveys, you know, and we went around to everybody and we're like, okay, what would you want to see in a hip hop community center? How would it work? You know, what would work, what wouldn't? And so people would take the time and they'd fill it out. And I brought back like, you know, 80 to 100 of these surveys, meet a couple of friends. And we came back and we just like put them back on the table. And we're like, okay, got them. And, you know, from there we thought it was all good. We got this three page thing. I got a couple surveys done. Like, where's the money? Let's go. Let's get started. And the guy's like, okay, cool. But, you know, you could have done this yourself. I'm like, oh. What are you telling me? Like, are you kidding me? He's like, okay, we gotta do a focus group. I'm like, a focus group? So you have to understand, I have no idea what the hell he's talking about. I'm like, yo, we got our group, we're focused, we're ready to go, <laughs> like, we're all here, you know? And he's just like, no, <laughs> a focus group is where we're gonna get people together, we're gonna sit down, you know, and we're gonna talk about the issues, we're gonna talk about how this can actually work. And I'm like, dude, what? Like, I'm gonna get all my friends to come in here, sit in this place that they already don't wanna come to and talk to you about what they wanna see. I'm like, oh, whatever. So what do we do? We go out, tell everyone, free food, barbecue at the community center, right? So everybody shows up, place is packed, it's rammed out. As Soon as they get there, they start eating the food, we lock the door behind them. We're like, yo, if you can eat our food, then you can answer some questions. Everyone's like, oh. 
I'm like, no, 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 chill, chill, chill. Remember, this is what you've actually, remember those surveys that everybody filled out? Everyone's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm like, well, somebody over here doesn't believe that you actually might want this community center, right? And, and this is something that we actually desire. And so he said, and so everyone starts talking. And what turned into something that we thought was gonna be the most arduous teeth pulling type of experience turned into people for two hours debating each other, standing on pool tables, calling each other morons, saying each other are brilliant, you know, and actually deciding for the first time what they wanted to see, how they wanted to spend their time, um, and, and what would be best for them in our own community. You know, from there, this program started to grow. We were able to get successful funding, um, and we started off with a small drop-in community center, the basement of the community center. We had turntables for public use. We had walls for graffiti. It was like a mini 416 expo. You know, there was open mics once a month. Over time, this program has expanded, always listening from the community. We started doing these open mics. People would start to win the open mic, and they'd say, you know, okay, I've won. Now what do I do? We say, I don't know. So we went out, and we went to the industry, and we got professionals to come in and to talk about the business. We called it the ropes. From there, we had the ropes where people were learning about the business in their own organic way, and through conversations, through dialogue with people. And then they said, okay, so I've won this thing. I have understanding a bit about how to promote myself, but I still can't afford to record anywhere. I, I just don't have the resources, you know? And so we said, okay, cool. Let's start a community, let's start a studio. And at this point, like, I, it was my turn to be like, yo, dude, you're, you're dreaming. It was my partner, Drex, at the time. And Drex is just like, okay, no, we're gonna make it happen. He writes the grant, he gets it, we start the studio. And from there, it's grown and it's grown and it's grown. What? From that point, now we have a fully operational recording studio where people are coming first come, first serve basis. They're getting to explore their creativity. They're getting to explore themselves. You know, they're starting to put down thoughts that they never really even knew that they had themselves. They're talking about issues in the community. They're also talking some bullshit. You know, they're talking every once in a while, that's what they're talking, but they're recording. They're doing something creative. They're using different faculties of their mind and we're having incredible dialogues. But at the same time, we were frustrated. We're like, you know, we still aren't really able to work with the people we wanna work with. It's a drop in, it's first come, first serve. I'm getting 34, 50 kids coming in per day for a six hour session. There's no way I can dedicate the time that I wanna to dedicate to these kids. And I feel like what we don't have in our communities is deep investment. You know, we have a lot of like really cool peripheral things, things that are happening in one-off situations, but we don't have that deep investment for the kids that really need it. Those brilliant, brilliant, brilliant minds that are being sucked off into different directions because one reason or another, whether it's mom needs help with the groceries, whether it's little brothers and sisters need support, or whether it's just themselves being pulled into negative spheres of influence. And so 2005 happened, as we all know, that was called Summer of the Gun here in Toronto is when a new record number of young people decided to start killing each other. Uh, something that had been happening for quite some time, but had been brought to light by a new number um, that made the newspapers and whatnot. And so when that happened, we were given an opportunity. Uh, the, you know, political will was there finally. They were like, we have to do something, we have to do something, we have to do something, but what? Um, and we had an opportunity to fill that void, and we filled that void. And today, where we're at now, is we have three full uh, streams of programming. The creative arts, the art of business, uh, which teaches around cultural industries, and the recording arts. And what this is, is basically a cultural incubator in the city of Toronto. And where it comes from is it comes from frustration. It comes from not wanting to sit there and be lectured to. Um, it comes from reading textbooks and not really understanding. It comes from a whole slew of different ways that we're frustrated by the community, uh, by the public education system and wanting to do something about it. And what it is, is that young people get the opportunity for the first time in their lives to build their own curriculum. It's a six month program where they actually go through it um, and build their own curriculum. They say, in six months, this is where I want to be. And we say, okay, if that's where you're going to be in six months, then we have to do this, 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 and this to get there. And if that's how we're going to get there, then we lay out these six-month manageable plans. Because as we all know, six months is an eternity for a young person, right? Like, it goes like this, but it feels like forever when you're waiting for it to happen. And so we build these six-month plans, and we work with them and provide industry mentors to basically build these roadmaps for success, you know, and to start seeing these goals, building self-confidence, saying I'm not an idiot, you know. I might not have had success within the school system, but I'm having successes here, and this is something I'm passionate about. Culture is our Trojan horse. It's the way that we get past the impenetrable defenses of young people who have been cheated by a system so many times, whether it be education, social services, housing, whatever the case may be, but they don't want to be involved in programs anymore. This is our Trojan horse. This is how we penetrate those defenses. And once we get past those defenses, those impenetrable shields that these young people hold so close to them from having their heart broken so many times, then that's when we can start to hit them with life skills. 
And that's when we can start to talk about things like credit and how does it affect you. We can start to talk about how do you walk into a meeting place? How do you actually attain the things that you are so passionate about? And we start to take the intuitive kind of skills that they've developed from living in the hood. Um, earlier, and I'm gonna wrap up just now, but earlier um, there was a conversation around the high rises that happened in Toronto. And this idea, uh, and there's some really cool conversation around retrofitting and I, I loved it. Um, but there's a talk of you know, these, these businesses that happen in, in the communities and how they could be transported into like little, fair, little fairs or whatnot, potentially and whatnot. And I brought up the point that the reason why a lot of these things wouldn't necessarily work uh, is because the, these businesses are black market businesses. You know, they, the, the houses on the fifth floor that are selling things, they're selling single cigarettes for 25 cents. They're selling beers for $3. You know, these are things that are unregulated markets that can only work in this type of environment. Um, but what there is, is a wealth, an absolute wealth of information, of skill, of talent, and of experience that's been built up. This last thing that I'll say is that when we do our interview process, um, we do a, a huge kind of intake process, and we do an interview process, and we talk to a young person who, let's say for the sake of argument, they want to get into starting clothing line in the Art of Business program. And we'll say, okay, so what kind of business skills do you have? And I'll be like, uh, you know, nothing really. You know, dropped out. Okay, so what's your level of education? I dropped out in grade 10. Okay, you dropped out in grade 10, you don't really have any experience, so why do you want to do this? Because I have so many ideas. Okay, well, what are your ideas? Tell me about them. So they start to talk about the ideas. They start to put down, okay, so do you have a name for this clothing line? Yeah, I got a name. Do you have a logo? Yeah, here's the logo. They pull it out of their pocket. There's this incredibly ornate, driven, or drawn logo that's absolutely beautiful. We say, okay, that's amazing. Um, but let's be real for a second, because a lot of our staff come from the same communities these kids come from. We say, okay, yo, off the record, have you ever sold a product before? <laughs> the kid will be like, I mean, yeah, like, <laughs> Like, okay, cool, so do you understand, like, you know that you have to get your money to go buy the product, right? Yeah. Okay, so then you know that you, you have an overall base price, you buy it wholesale. Then you break it down and you retail it, right, for lower prices. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. So once you bring that money in, can you just go spend all that money? Nah, I need my re-up. Yeah, exactly, you go, need to go re-up on your merchandise, but you understand a budget then, don't you? you understand that some of this money can go to re-upping your merchandise and the other money can go towards buying groceries, helping moms out, or buying those Jordans that you want. So you understand a budget? Yeah, I understand. It. Okay, yeah, yeah, I understand a budget. Okay, cool, have you ever worked with the staff? What do you mean? Have you ever pooled your resources together with people and then you were in charge of breaking out who does what? Yeah, yeah, of course, I'm a boss, I'm a boss. And you're like, okay, so you're a boss, you know? So you have these skills, you have, let's see, let's break it down, you've developed a brand, you understand the, the concepts of retail versus wholesale. You understand sales. You understand supply and demand, what happens in a drought, prices go up. You know what I mean? And you understand working with the staff. You have incredible skills that you've learned out of necessity. You know, desperation breeds ingenuity. And these are the lessons that we try to import. And it's this idea of creatively understanding the skills and the resources within these communities and then what's needed to support that. Deep investment, time, understanding, and capital.